Good morning and welcome to the City of Rapid City Planning Commission meeting for January 25th, 2018. If any member of the audience wishes to speak to an item on the Planning Commission agenda, there are speaker request forms on the table along the left wall. Please fill out the request with the agenda item number of the item you wish to speak to and hand it to the staff seated on the left of the dais. At this time, we would also like to ask that if any member of the audience has a cell phone or other electronic device, that you either turn it off or turn the ringer to silent. If you need to take a call, please step out to the hallway so that the meeting is not disrupted. <coughs> Items one through six have been placed on the consent calendar and may be approved as a group. Action will be taken on all consent items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar by any planning commissioner, staff member, or audience member for separate consideration at this time. The findings of this planning commission are recommendations to the city council. The city council will make the final decision with the exception of the following items. Item 3, 17 PD 056. The Rapid City Planning Commission's actions on this item is final unless any party appeals that decision to the Rapid City Council. All appeals must be submitted in writing to the Community Planning and Development Services Department by close of business on the seventh full calendar day following action by the Planning Commission. Are there any items one through six that staff would like removed from the consent calendar? Number two. Number two. Are there any items one through six that the Planning Commission would like removed from the consent calendar? Three. Number three. And are there any items one through six that any audience member would like removed? The chair would then entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar items one through six with the exception of items two and three in accordance with staff's recommendation. So moved. Galen made the motion and Karen seconded the motion to approve items one, four, five, and six per staff's recommendation. Any Discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number two. Item number two is 17RZ036, a rezoning request from low density residential to medium density residential district for land approximately 15.657 acres in size. Property, as you can see, is on low density residential. As there's property to the east, it's right on the boundary with the county. So to the south, it's, I believe, suburban residential. And then the uh, remainder of the property is zoned on that west side office commercial district. Uh, the medium density residential district allows a higher density of development going from single family all the way up to apartments. Uh, we pulled this item from the consent calendar because we did receive a phone call from uh, one of the neighbors along uh, this side with concerns regarding what future development could be. Uh, in addition, received an email from Commissioner uh, Bowman uh, with some questions regarding the rezoning and potentially using a planned development designation uh, in conjunction with the rezoning, which is an option. Uh, for the Planning Commission. Uh, as you can see from the aerial, uh, property is currently void of any structural development. There is single family to the uh, east and the south. Uh, the reason this was on the consent agenda is that the future land use for the area is urban neighborhood district, which supports higher density residential development. Um, and uh, the comprehensive plan supports higher density residential in the uh, North Elkvale neighborhood area, which is, all, which is where this uh, property is located and shown in the comprehensive plan. Uh, there we see a uh, major street plan, there are a couple collector streets, but nothing running through this area of the rezoning except on that west side. Uh, Collector Street, Neal Street, extending north. And then an exhibit from the applicant. So uh, staff's recommendation on this is to approve the rezoning. Um, are there any questions for staff at this time? And the applicant is uh, in the audience if there are any questions. Uh, Mike Klosny. 
Can you expand a little bit on the, the problem the individual brought up? Was it because of the possibility of big apartments or? Yes, it was uh, their concern is that with the, some of the, the proposed rezoning, it's a little bit higher than where their uh, properties are on that east side. And their concern is a three-story apartment building being constructed around here that, that would be looking down into their property. Okay, thank you. Karen? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That, that is the question that I was kind of referring to. That property has got a huge hill on it. It's got great views of the west, and it'd be a beautiful location for any home up there. And I don't have any issue with uh, an apartments being there, but right along that strip, it does, it would look straight down because the houses are below that top of that hill. And so I guess my quest question is, um, does the applicant have any idea of where those apartments might be or if he's got any plans to put more single family or, or duplexes or something along that side of it so it's not quite so intrusive to the neighborhood? And if not, that was my question as far as having a planned development so the neighbors would know what was going up there. Mr. Estes, would you be willing to speak to that? Would you like me to fill out a speaker form? No, no just <laughs> identify yourself up here. Can I just touch this? That tells you how to. Yep. I, this is Doyle Estes. My, I'm the owner of the applicant, and that area right in here. I just got to touch it. I have had lots, about 24 lots designed for that for about 10 years and it doesn't work economically because as someone indicated it's kind of a difficult site to build on and I hadn't come up with any idea what to do with this until recently the city um, did a new sewer and water line right through this area <clears throat> and part of that project they graded the area so now it opens up the opportunity to do some development if we can put enough units per acre. With respect to Ms. Bowman, I don't have a plan in mind yet what I'm going to put in there. When I heard that there was a question about the height of buildings in there, I checked with my engineer, Mr. Trelar. He tells me the city's regulation is for apartments or for the height that you can build on is 35 feet, which is not um, generally acceptable for apartment for buildings that have a pitched roof so you'll have to come back and get a variance if you try to build in excess of 35 feet am I right Kyle yep so my thought right now is the only thing of the only idea that I've had is along what's marked there in the green is Avenue A is to put a series of fourplexes in there now I keep hearing that we're trying to have affordable housing or workforce housing in this area. Well, to get prices down, you have to do, in my view, one of three things. You have to get more units per acre, so you have less land cost per living unit. You have to build smaller units, or you have to build at a cheaper materials. The construction cost per square foot is pretty consistent. So. My idea is to take this area and put more units per acre and try to get the price down per living unit. And that's what I need to do. If I can get this rezoning approved by the city, I am more apt to build Big Sky Drive, which everyone in this area out here in Rapid Valley would like to have another way to get on into um, Elkvale. And right now, the only way to get on Elkvale is a little bit north of this area. You have to go up by the dentist up on uh, Bernice and then come down on Timmins and so if this rezoning can get through I am more apt to build or extend Big Sky Drive over to Timmins or over to Neal Street and come north and we'll have another way to, for all those people to get out so in everything there's a good and there's a bad I am more apt to I mean I, if I can get the rezoning approved I am going to put more development in there but as the offside or the upside of the development is we'll have better transportation for all those people living in this area to get out. It'll, be, it'll make 
it more economically feasible to develop the area. That, you know, as to the area along here, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I would suspect a series of fourplexes or units like that. Thank you, Mr. Estes. Karen? Okay. Thank, thank you, Doyle. I, I think for, for me, I don't think anybody up there, there's quite a few uh, apartments and there's quite a few single-family homes up there. I understand the idea of putting in, you know, numerous units, as you say. And I think for, for me, it was the idea that that is such a tall hill right there. And if you put a three-story apartment complex up there, that would be just like standing all by itself it would really show up all the way across Rapid City. It's, I mean, it's that big of a hill. And so, you know, I don't mind having fourplexes along that area or something like that. I just didn't want to see a big three-story apartment complex on top of that. And I know you have to do some platting to, to do that probably, but... Um, again, again, Ms. Bowman, <coughs> according to Ms. Tr Mr. Trelaw, and I'm sure the city staff can confirm, the city's height requirement in that area, the height restriction, is 35 feet. With a pitched roof, you can't build three story. So I would have to get a variance to be able to do that. So the rezoning is not going to open the door for three story units. There's going to be another run through to get that if that was to be built. I don't have that kind of plan. I mean, I don't have any plan for this area right here other than try to put more units per acre so I can justify the cost of developing the area. I mean, I've owned that land for about over 10 years. Okay, I, 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 that's my comments as far as, you know, if you don't know and we don't know, maybe the idea of having a planned development wouldn't be a bad idea. But I would like to ask the staff if, if what can go in there? Mr. Chair? Yeah, Vicki. So regarding height, our height limitation in a residential district is 35 feet or three stories. We have several apartment buildings throughout the city in medium density residential zoning districts that are three stories that don't exceed the height regulation. The height is measured uh, to the median of the pitch so that it does allow for a full three stories. The medium density residential would allow single family, townhome, or apartment development as per the density regulations set forth in medium density residential. So depending upon the size of the lot that the applicant would create as a part of the platting, that would identify the number of units per lot. Thanks, Vicki. Thank you. That's, that's my comments. I just wanted to see what everybody else had to say about it. Vince? Thank you. This on. I, can you? I can't sure. Hear you. Let me try it one more time. There we go. You mentioned that, uh, oh, there it is. You mentioned that uh, you're interested in creating housing for low income and workforce. What, do you know what the average price of, uh, of an apartment rent to rent an apartment here is in the city? No. Okay. But I, I have recently a market study done about the feasibility of units and the study that I'm getting back is to cite for the workforce housing loan that I'm looking at is about $1,100 one thousand to eleven hundred dollars per month for a two bedroom two bath unit now I just attended the loan I, the, excuse me the loan I'm looking at it's a workforce housing loan we're half the units for that and that's the limitations about a thousand to eleven hundred dollars per month two bedroom two bath unit and I just attended the collective impact meeting here a, a couple of days ago and they talked about uh, the average price, uh, somewhere around $870. I don't have an exact dollar amount, but uh, that seems it's going to be a little bit over. Uh, it, so, again, this is something that you're looking for for low income and workforce housing. I did not use low income. I, I said there's a big drive. I hear I went to those housing unit start, um, meetings. I go to meetings, and there's an interest or a lot of talk about trying to make affordable housing or workforce housing. Again, you, you ha something has to give. You have to build smaller units. You have to put more units per acre. You have, to get the, you have to get the land or the infrastructure costs down, or you get a, a, a break on financing. I have a financing program that gives me the break on that, but if I build larger units, I still can't afford it to be within the parameters of workforce housing. And 
regardless of the 850 number you're coming in, yeah. the loan program to the State Housing Authority is limited to some like 50 or 60 percent of the normal income or the average income in the Pennington County Rapid City area. And that limitation is about 1,000 to 1,000 to 1,100 per month. That's the loan limitation of the loan program I'm getting on. Thank you, sir. I stand corrected. You didn't say low income, uh, so, so thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. Any further questions or comments on this one? Uh, Mike? Thank you. Does the plan development then, <coughs> excuse me, does it in, uh, Will it do the Big Sky Drive? Will that be included if we have a planned development so that that road is put in? Or does that not, would that not affect that one way or another? Yeah, Vicki. So the platting of the property will trigger the requirement to construct the, the streets, uh, not necessarily the future land use itself. It's when he goes to subdivide, that street would be required regardless of what's constructed on it. Thanks, Vicki. Um, seeing no other lights up, I'd look for a motion unless there's further questions. Galen made the motion to approve item number two per staff recommendations. Is there a second? John seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number three. John, you pulled this one. I don't have it magic. Oh. Yeah, I'm just curious as what's going on. It, it looks like she's changing the request for zoning into something else, right? Because we have a follow-up item on this. What? Sure. Uh, maybe you can this item 17 PD 056 is a planned development revocation. So you'll notice this week we changed the, the boundary. It didn't include this lot over here. Uh, but the revocation is for the planned developments and planned development designations around this area. Uh, in addition to that, that rezoning which was on the consent calendar was from light industrial to general commercial for this area. Uh, being that it's lo located along East Mall Drive and its future land use is, uh, I believe, mixed use commercial, uh, we're looking at it and saying this is how it should be zoned. And without the plan development, all development will be in compliance with the zoning ordinance. So it appears to be a win-win on in this case. So. That's why they're in, you know, our recommendation is that they, the plan development does it, revocation be approved in conjunction with the rezoning so that if the rezoning is denied in the future or withdrawn before it goes to council, the plan development will stay in place because it's still light industrial. Does that make sense? Or If I can ask, the, yeah. the plan developments that exist on this were put in place for developments that never materialized, correct? Mr. Chair? Yeah. So back in the day, and this was a few years ago, there was a trend that if anyone came in to zone property from no use to whatever, which is what happened in this case, uh, planned development designations were placed on huge amounts of acreages uh, as a, a, a normal action by the city. This is one of those areas. Uh, when there was a request here a few years back to change that western portion to light industrial, the argument was, well, it is in a planned development, so we'd get to see what kind of industrial uses would come forward to make sure that they're in line with the other commercial activity within close proximity to Cabela's. Um, we don't have any knowledge of what may, might come forward. But this is an example of where we've got blanket plan developments without any real good reason why. And the general commercial uses and design standards 
by typical ordinance, give the city some pretty good guidelines as to what that development's gonna look like in the future. So we are certainly in support of using this as an example of where um, we are removing some plan developments and allowing things to come forward with just a building permit. Thanks, Vicki. Karen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think also, Vicki, didn't at that time, we talked about plan developments along those major corridors to see if we could get some additional landscaping or something for people coming into to Rapid or along that area. I don't know. I, I, it seemed like I remember that. In particular on this one, when the property was platted and the city was working with Cabela's, I think it was more so that we wanted to see what other uh, development was going to come in to ensure that some of the city contributions were recovered. And uh, enough time has gone by that I think that we've seen additional development in this area and um, we're meeting the goals of what we set out to do. I don't believe that this particular area was specific to landscaping. Thanks, Vicki. I uh, don't have any other lights up on this one. I'd look for a motion unless there's more discussion. Karen made the motion to approve item three and Mike seconded that motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item number seven. Uh, Mr. Chair, could we take items number uh, seven and eight concurrently? Sure. Item seven is a uh, initial and final plan development overlay to allow a commercial development, which includes a bank and a coffee shop, uh, both with drive-through lanes, and the associated rezoning is to change the uh, zoning use of, or zoning of the property from low density residential district to general commercial district. Uh, here we can see it's located uh, north of the intersection of Fifth Street and Parkview Drive on the south side of the city. Uh, we've got general commercial to the south. Uh, that public district is, is for drainage, but around it is general commercial. And we have some office commercial to the east and west. The request to general commercial district is because they're proposing a coffee shop and that would not be a permitted, is not identified as a permitted use in the office commercial district. However, it is uh, permitted in the general commercial district. So for the rezoning, that's why they're going to general commercial district. The plan development locks in the use to what they're proposing and how they're showing it. So you'll notice one of the stipulations of approval of the plan development is that any expansion of use or any change in use will require a major amendment to the plan development, which will come before you again to be heard. And also, also notice the neighborhood uh, as to what's going on. Uh, currently, the property is void of any structural development. Uh, we have an office building on that west side. And the property does back up to uh, single family homes. There is a fence uh, or fences located along that north property line uh, constructed by the, the residential properties. And another one of the stipulations of approval is that at all times a fence needs to be along that property line. So if one of those residential properties removed the fence, it'd be the property owner, this property owner's responsibility to replace it and make sure it stays in place. Uh, here you can see uh, future land use. It does show the property as low density neighborhood, which reflects the current zoning. Um, Fifth Street is identified as a principal arterial street. Parkview Drive is identified as a uh, collector street. So that's in order to move higher traffic, th that's the type of streets we have there. And it isn't ideal for residential, especially low density residential development. In addition, there's a non-access easement platted along the property line running all the way back here. So there really is only one access to this property. So it doesn't, it wouldn't be helpful to really to plat this in the smaller lots and have single family along a uh, arterial street and a collector street with heavy traffic right next to an office building. It does make sense to go to more of a commercial use uh, and the Future, and the comprehensive plan supports land use flexibility 
Uh, adjacent property to the south is mixed-use commercial, and to the east and the west, we have employment center. Now, what this also doesn't show us is that to the south, we have a community activity center, which is uh, the Walmart Supercenter area community activity center, which supports uh, higher density mixed-use development uh, in, in areas such as this, and uh, it supports the, the rezoning. And here we see that major street plan, uh, Fifth Street leading down to Catron Boulevard, and then we have Parkview Drive, a collector street. And if we go back to this, this is the uh, location of the Walmart Supercenter, and the community activity center is really around this, so it's the property is on the periphery of that. Uh, site plan, you see the, the approach located uh, further up along Parkview Drive. There's a minimum separation from uh, 5th Street, or between an arterial street and a collector street where they intersect. It has to be a certain distance back, and with the non-access easement in place, that's where it will be located. Uh, drive-through lanes, that's the drive-through lane for the coffee shop. We have drive-through lanes for the uh, bank. On the other side, floor plan showing the, the breakdown inside the building of uh, coffee shop area with an outdoor seating area, and then the rest of it is uh, the bank. Landscaping plan. Uh, this is the side that is closer to the or along the backyards of those residential properties So they are pro proposing some some additional buffering with the landscaping and you'll notice one of the stipulations of approvals to ensure that that buffer is maintained and, and in a live vegetative state In order to provide that buffer uh, Elevations, but here we have a better elevation showing uh, this is that north side. So the coffee shop, there's the sign for it, um, the drive through going by. One of the concerns is uh, let me see if I have the applicant is proposing uh, rooftop uh, mechanical equipment on this north side of the building uh, on top of the, the structure. Uh, our one of our concerns is that those residential neighbors are a little bit higher, so bringing that mechanical equipment a little bit higher might, depending on, on, on how much noise it generates, might cause a, an issue. So you'll notice the stipulation of approval is that uh, upon submittal of a building permit that uh, noise data on, on their mechanical equipment be submitted, and if it exceeds a certain noise level, then they either need to demonstrate that their proposed buffering of it, which at this time is a four-foot wall, is adequate, or that, you know, they, they provide buffering which is adequate, or that they move the mechanical equipment to the ground so that it doesn't create that, that uh, noise issue for the residential neighbors. <clears throat> uh, looking into the property from Parkview Drive uh, to the north, uh, signs are posted on the property. Here you can see those existing screening fences and how the, the property rises a bit from, from south to, to north up to those residential uh, properties. Uh, the fire hydrant is about the location of the uh, approach. Looking along Parkview Drive, uh, the property on the opposite side of Parkview Drive, which is also currently undeveloped, and we have some, looks like, apartments in the distance. Uh, looking back into that property uh, and towards the, mo the more commercial development along 5th Street and Stumer. And then uh, this is looking at the back side of not Walmart, but uh, the, the strip mall uh, to the east of Walmart, but this is the location 
And this is looking at Fifth Street and Parkview Drive intersection. And again, looking down Fifth Street towards the intersection with Catron Boulevard. So a lot of uh, heavily trafficked streets in the area. And this is looking from the uh, office building Mandalay Bay on that uh, west side of the property into the property and, and into where those residential uh, to the north is. And again, along Fifth Street, uh, north and south. And then the adjacent uh, office building on the adjacent property. Uh, as stated, it's, it's the property is located at the intersection of an arterial street and a collector street. Uh, we have similar zonings to the east, west, and south, general commercial to the south, office commercial to the east and west. Uh, it's located, on, the property is located on the northern periphery of a community activity center which supports higher density mixed use and uses that will support residents, residents and, and workers in the area. And then the uh, final plan development will serve as the tool to ensure that what the applicant has proposed that they're going to build here, that any change, any expansion of use will require a major amendment and that the neighbors be noticed and that the, the, it be reviewed by the Planning Commission. So with that, staff's recommendation is to approve uh, the rezoning request in conjunction with the initial and final plan development and that the initial and final plan development be approved in conjunction with the rezoning request. So that if the rezoning is denied at City Council or it doesn't move forward, then the plan development will go away. Are there any questions for staff? Thanks, Fletcher. I got a couple lights up. Uh, Mike Kwasney. Uh, we, I, I like the use of this property. I think it's a, a good use. I like that we identified the noise as a possibility of a problem. Did we identify, is there going to be any signage on the back side of that building that would cause w lighting problems for the neighborhood behind? This is the applicant's rendering showing that signage on that north side of the building. So we do have on the building itself, Med 5, and then the little coffee shop sign. Uh, and then if I get to another page, I'll show you where the location of the proposed signage is on that intersection of Fifth Street and Parkview Drive. So that's the signage that they're proposing. And that signage that I showed you on the previous page would be on this side of the building. And we have the single family residential along there. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Vicki. It is important to note that there is a significant elevation differential between Fifth Street and the residential development to the north. In order to develop this site, there'll be grading done. Uh, that landscaping that you see on the east or north lot line uh, is going to be in, put in place and retained using a retaining wall. So there is a significant differential there. And with that privacy fence, it is highly unlikely that they would see the signage as proposed in its location on the building. If that helps, Mike. Yeah. Our concern, of course, is always that sometimes we get into residential areas and we throw that s the light out to them, and uh, that would be the concern. I, I don't see any significant lighting that's really going to flash at them. So... Uh, I don't see that it's going to be a big problem. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kurt? Thank you. Uh, I think, you know, changing the zoning makes a lot of sense. Um, the, you know, low-density residential with that single point of access, it seems like it's going to be very tough to make that, make that go. Um, the limited access, the being next to an arterial and a collector street, it just makes more sense to be some type of, of commercial development, and I would be in favor of this. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, any other questions or comments on this item? Uh, if not, I guess I'd look for a motion on item 7 and 8.
Mike made the motion to approve item seven and eight per staff recommendations. Second. Kurt seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine. Item number nine is 17 PD 058, a major amendment to a plan development to allow an on sale liquor establishment in conjunction with a hotel. Properties located along Luna Avenue, zone general commercial district with the plan development. We've seen this recently in the past year, uh, plan development to approve a hotel on the property. Uh, in addition, there's another hotel that we also saw recently here and then to the north west a little bit over there so this is developing out with hotels in particular the applicant having built the hotel now is looking to have uh, social hours in the lobby that's open to guests only and it's three days a week Mondays Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 5 30 p.m. to 7 30 p.m. so very limited and you'll notice in the stipulations of approval that we're recommend you know recommendation is to approve with their as long as they, they, it's with a hotel and they, they remain in compliance with their operations plan, which states those days and hours of operation. Uh, Ariel is not updated yet, but there's currently a, a hotel on the property being constructed. Uh, future land use is mixed use commercial. This is another one that's on the periphery of a community activity center to the, to the northeast. We have uh, Rushmore Crossing. Luna Avenue is identified as a collector street uh, connecting up to Eglin to the north and uh, East Anamosa to the south, which is a minor arterial street. And the site plan for the hotel showing uh, parking and the location of the building. And then uh, floor plan showing the location here of their uh, great lobby and where they would be having these social hours three days a week. And then this smaller box here shows their pantry where they're proposing off sale, uh, beer and wine sales. So that, that's not under review as part of this, but they, they included it to show that they'll also have an area within the building where they'll sell to guests of the hotel. And again, this is only going to be open to guests of the hotel. Uh, here we have what's what's currently up there, located on the property, looking north along uh, Luna towards uh, Eglin Street. Uh, and here we have the location of that future hotel on that northwest side, which we've reviewed in the past. And this is the back side of the Walmart located along uh, La Crosse Street. Again, uh, back side of Walmart and uh, the property to that west side is currently undeveloped. And then looking uh, again on that west side back towards Anamosa Street, still the back side of Walmart. And then looking south along Luna towards Anamosa Street. And this is looking uh, to the property to the south, which is also currently undeveloped. Uh, staff is recommending that the major amendment be approved with stipulations noted in the staff report for the reasons I've just uh, explained. So if there are any questions for staff at this time? <clears throat> I don't see anybody chiming in. Galen made the motion to approve uh, this item per staff recommendations. Second. Mike seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10. Mr. Chair, yeah, um, before we get started on item number 10, we would like to introduce to you Javin Weaver. He is our new urban planner that we hired. This is his ninth day with the city, so we are, we're throwing him into things pretty quick. Be gentle with him. This is his first uh, public presentation before a planning commission. So with that, I'll turn it over to Javin. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Item number 10 is a proposed major amendment for an artisan distillery located at 601 Kansas Street. It's Kansas City Street, correct, John? Commissioner Bullman has asked a few questions about this proposal, and I hope I can answer her questions throughout this presentation. Let me take you through some slides. The property is located within the Central Business District, or er, zoned Central Business District. You can see surrounding places around it are the same zone. In December 2017, the City Council amended the ordinance to allow an artisan distillery as a conditional use within the Central Business District. Here you can see an aerial view of the property. You can see some open space just north and also south of it. This property is a one-story commercial building that's with it, that also houses Hate Camp Microbrewery, a coffee shop, and a theater space. In 2006, the Planning Commission also approved the microbrewery to be located within this area. This map shows the future land use, which is identified as downtown. Now you can see the major street plans for the area. The property is located against adjacent to local streets. You have 5th Street, Mount Rushmore Road, St. Joseph, and Main Street as principal arterial roads within the area. This is a site plan identifying the property of the proposed artisan distillery. The applicant is proposing the artisan distillery will be about 3,000 square feet. There will be a door located on the property about right here. And then there will be a outdoor raised patio measured about 10 by 20 feet. That will be raised with a four foot railing that would act as a barrier between the parking lot and the outdoor race patio. The applicant has addressed that no more than 50,000 gallons will, will be processed each year and that, that the state regulates, or the state issues the license for this. And the applicants indicated that they will be distributing and having on sale of their products, however, their primary purpose will be to will be to distill process. These are applicants' elevation views of the property. This is a proposed sign that will be located on the north side of the building above the entry right where the, near the patio. So it will be right there for the location of that sign. This was looking southwest of the property. This is south looking at the proposed entrance where that will be. East on Kansas City Street looking towards 5th Street. Looking west on Kansas, Kansas City Street. This is southwest towards an adjacent property called the Hope Center. Looking north and directly in front of the property at the public library. Looking north down 6th Street where you can see the Hotel Alex Johnson in the background. Looking south on 6th Street towards the Performing Arts Center. This is west down an alley on the south side of the property. If you, if you go down the alley, you will be able to look at the delivery area where they will be receiving their goods and sending them off. Central Business District is considered an appropriate location of, for an artist and distillery. With on-sale liquor, the location of this property is located in a commercial activity generating pedestrian-oriented uses, which are desirable. Their proposed artist and distillery will encourage this types of high-intensity commercial uses. This area is 
in compliance with current zoning and with future land use zonings for it. Letters have been sent out to property owners in the area and we have not heard responses back from them. Staff recommends that this is a conditional, staff recommends that this conditional use permit be approved with stipulations. Do you have any, are there any questions for staff? And the applicant is also present in the audience. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Vicky. Just to clarify a couple things. Thank you, Jevin, you did a great job. Um, you do, you probably do recall that just in December, you uh, did approve an ordinance amendment that was brought forward by this applicant, Randy Decker, to allow artisan distillery as a conditional use in the central business district and the general commercial district. He had noted at that time that this property was one that he was looking at. Uh, we're very sensitive to the, thought, the fact that there are other uses. We have the library across the street. We've got churches in the area. And at, Fletcher's telling me no. <laughs> Is that not true? It's TSP. Oh, it's old TSP, old library. Alley. Thank you. I thought that doesn't look big enough to be our library. Um, but at the, at the end of this, what we did look at is that in this downtown core, as identified by our comprehensive plan, we are trying to get those activities that encourages pedestrians to come in and be active in these businesses. Uh, Randy is here today, and I do hope that you take some testimony from him as to what, how his business is conducted. They will be distilling uh, spirits primarily on this property. Secondary to that, there will be tasting and the opportunity to sit down and enjoy the spirits that are being produced by his company as a part of what he is proposing. He might even have some entertainment from times. Uh, their hours of operation are from noon till 10 p.m. Uh, it's not your late evening crowd. Um, and in addition to this, anything that is being distributed out of this site, as Javin pointed out, they do have the doors to the south along the alley and Randy's identified that a pickup is used to pick up the product and transport it to a distributor elsewhere within the city. So just noting that this is a use uh, that would be creating the spirit. Secondary would be the on-sale component, and maybe we could get some testimony from Randy as to what that would include. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, I do have a speaker request for him, but Kurt, do you have a question for staff on this? Well, I don't know if it's so much for staff, maybe the the owner and, and Vicki touched on a lot of what I was wondering. Um, one thing I didn't see in there and, and you know, uh, what is an artesian distillery? I mean, what are we making? So, um, an artisan distillery, and I had to actually look up the definition of artisan, and it's a craftsman. Yeah. So it's making um, your hard liquors versus a microbrewery that makes beer. Right. Um, when I sat down with Randy when we brought forward the ordinance amendment, because just like you, I, I didn't know what it was. And he explained to me that they bring a product in at 150 proof, and then they cut that with ingredients for consumption. And they have different recipes, and people can come in and create their own and provide their own recipe. And so it's your brandies and liqueurs and et cetera. And maybe we, this would be a good time to have Randy explain a little more on that. Okay. So, so it's not like a, a whiskey or a rum or, I mean, it, it, or what? We probably should get uh, Randy up here if he's willing to give us a short overview of what his proposed operations here are. Well, current operations. I'll try and make it as short as I can. Um, what we actually do is we take a 190 proof uh, grain neutral spirits that is actually distilled at a different location, from a different location across the state. We are licensed through the federal government, through the TTB uh, Tobacco and uh, Trade Bureau, as a uh, processor and warehouseman. We bring in the distilled spirit, the neutral grain spirits. We process it, as Vicki was saying, with other ingredients to make it a drinkable liqueur. We make a vodka and a liqueur is what we make with different flavors of liqueurs and different flavors of vodkas. What makes the difference between the vodkas and the liqueurs is a sugar content, flavoring contents, and things like, and proof. 
Our, the, the vodka we make is an 80 proof. The liqueurs we make are a 52 proof. So, so you're not actually making the liquor there. You're just the neutral spirits. It. And this is something I've had to learn over the years, over the last three or four years. All alcohol distilled spirits start with neutral spirits. That's 190 proof. That's your Everclear. Is basically all it is. All liquor starts at that 190 proof level. What's done to it after that is what makes it a bourbon, a whiskey, a scotch, a rum, a vodka, or anything else. But it all starts at that same process. We basically, at this time, are not licensed to actually distill that 190 proof neutral spirit. Our federal license is as a processor and warehouseman. With the state, that falls under the artisan distillery or the distillery license. And we originally had a dis full distillery license to start with. Um, we found a processor in this, or a distiller within the state that we could buy our neutral spirits from, which turns around and makes it a, allows us to get the artisan distillery license. Okay. So then you, uh, is it just tasting or they actually, you actually order drinks and stuff? We can actually, with the state artisan license, we can do on sale and off sale. So we do the processing. We also we sell to a distributor in South Dakota, Johnson Brothers of South Dakota is our South Dakota distributor. We also self-distribute across South Dakota different locations that Johnson Brothers doesn't deal with. We are we do have distributors in North Dakota, Nebraska, and we sell to the state of Wyoming because they're a state distributorship. They don't have distributors. All them everything goes to the state there. So we do deal with North Dakota, Nebraska, and Wyoming also, and we're across the state of South Dakota. Um, with that artisan license, like I said, on sale and off sale. So when we got that license back in May of this year, just, or May of 2017, when we got switched over to that license, out in Box Elder, we did open up a tasting room and a retail store. That only allows us to sell or consume our products that are made on site. So it's not like we can go out and buy Jack Daniels or uh, Tavarsky Vodka or McCormick or something like that and we're running a full bar. It's our products that we make and we can sell the bottles there on site if people come in the tasting tasting is limited to by state law two ounces per person per day so you're basically talking two shots we generally do if you've ever stopped out at our location I don't believe any of you have but if you ever had or seen us at our different locations when we do tastings at liquor stores or the state fair or central states fair uh, stock show things like that we do a lot of tastings around we just do little quarter ounce shots because we do have five or six flavors currently on the market. So we do quarter ounce shots. That way people can try three or four different flavors. Okay. So it's a, <clears throat> that was going to be my other question to staff was what's the difference between this and a, you know, a liquor license. But um, I think, I think I've got that answer. So thank you. Nope. No other questions. Thank you. Uh, while Randy's up here, Rachel, John, do you have anything that he could answer for you? Yeah, yeah, okay. For Rachel? So um, I think this is a great project. You know, I think uh, artisan distilleries and anything that's, you know, artisan is really good for the downtown area and really good for Rapid City. So I want to put that out there. Um, and, I, and I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, but I did see that the Hope Center is nearby, and I know that some of those folks struggle with addiction. So I just wanted to kind of check in with you and see your sensitivity level to that, and um, and also, you know, how you think that you guys can be good neighbors. I suppose is a question. Well, I know with Hay Camp Brewery, since they went into that location, they've actually ad addressed several concerns that were brought up when the permits were granted to them. And from what we've understand, both from the planning, uh, planning office and from the police department, the officers that we've talked to, Haycamp has actually done a great deal of cleanup in that area and eliminated a lot of the problems of people hanging out in the alleyways and things like that. Um, myself, I'm a former law enforcement officer, about 19 years law enforcement before I went back in the military and finished up my career and retired from the military. Um, so I've done a lot of work with that type of stuff. Even in our location, current location out in Box Elder, we'll get the people that wander in. It's obvious they don't need to try any of our product. They're already inebriated, they're already intoxicated, and we don't serve them. We, we're aware of those situations. We've, we've had family members that have those issues. We don't accept that as far as being a part of that problem. 
we try to eliminate that from our, from our situations. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure you were sensitive to that. Absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're fully aware of the Hope Center. We, uh, my partner Jerry's done some work there, uh, volunteer work with them as far as, because he's in the construction business, so he's done some work with them as far as painting and stuff, uh, stairwell and uh, laundry room and stuff that they put in. And okay, thank you. John? You mentioned off-sale, but your request is only for on-sale liquor establishment. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Vicki. So the request is to allow an artisan distillery. It's important to note that the on-sale liquor component of this is regulated by the state, not the city. If this were uh, a typical bar or uh, a microbrewery, uh, the city, they would have to follow up and get a liquor license through the city council. That's not the case here. As we had gone through as a part of the ordinance amendment, the state regulates the on-sale. Our on-sale liquor licenses, whether they be for hard liquor or beer or wine, allow you to sell any product. When the state regulates it, they say you can only sell the product you make on this site. So it's more limiting than, what, than our liquor license would allow. So the city is going to allow off-sale liquor sales at this site? That would be permitted in any central business property. It's just retail. On sale is the part that we regulate through a conditional use. But typically with off sale you have to have a license. This is a whole new game. If we could have Carla perhaps jump in here. Yes, under state law, it's the state that issues the license for the artisan distillery. And um, there's not a component like there is with other off-sale um, licenses where the city can, can license it. This is the license to sell on-sale and off-sale is solely through the state. And, um, and the city's authority in this area is, is through a conditional use permit for the on-sale. A little bit different than like with other um, alcohol establishments where you have to get a city license as well as a conditional use permit. Hmm. I mean, I'm I'm in favor of the on sale. I'm I'm not in favor of the off sale in that location. It just I don't think you'd get a license issued in that location <clears throat> with proximity to the church and the library and the Hope Center and all that. I don't know. Thanks, John. Uh, I do have a speaker request from Bill Waugh, uh, if you'd like to say a few words. Please identify yourself once you're at the microphone. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am Bill Waugh. I'm the business administrator for the First United Methodist Church. Uh, and I have to preface before I get into it that uh, we received the notice last week. And so our leadership council that governs our church has not been able to act on this or come to a consensus on this. I did visit with some of them. I have not had a chance to visit with the uh, board members or the uh, director of the Hope Center. Uh, our church started the Hope Center. And over the years, we have separated that from the church and made it so, its own separate 501c3. Um, so I'm, I'm not speaking uh, for the entire church, or the, and in no way am I speaking for the Hope Center. I was hoping that they would have a representative here today, but uh, they don't. Um, but as a church, um, the consensus from the folks I've talked to is they're concerned about having uh, not necessary, necessarily the distilling part of the process, but the actual selling of their product that close to the Hope Center and to the church. Um, the gentleman made the comment that the Hay Camp is, has uh, work towards cleaning up that alleyway between uh, Hay Camp, our church, the Hope Center, and the uh, library. Uh, but there is still a lot of activity back there. The Hope Center gets anywhere from two to four hundred guests a day go through there. And they all are around where his 
distillery will be. Uh, I compliment him on what he's trying to do. Uh, I'm pro-business, more power to him. My concern is the sampling and the selling of their product in that building. Those are my comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Thank you. Um, first, I, I'm, I guess, with Bill, I, 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 I think that uh, this entity is, is something that is exciting for the, for the Rapid City area. And, and I have a few more questions I, I think probably that Randy will probably be able to answer. But um, let's start with that, I guess, Randy. When you, when you say this is a, a tasting kind of thing, when I was in another location and I went to one of those places like you have, and we walked in, and it was kind of on a main street, so it was just downtown, and we walk in, and they have different samples of things all over, and you ask the, the person that is waiting on you, can I taste this? And they give you just a little cup thing, of, so you can taste it, so you, you know whether you want to buy that product. Is that kind of what you're looking for? Yes, ma'am. That is exactly what we're doing. Okay. Do you also have, like, a night, you're going to say, where everybody come in and you can taste is up to two ounces. Do you do something like that also? Not any particular night, no. We, that's generally, whenever we're open, the tasting room is open, the, the retail store is open. Uh, not only do we sell the alcohol, but we have T-shirts, things like hats, stuff like that. Um, so whenever somebody comes in, obviously we check IDs. One of the things when she was talking about the... the uh, License license is issued by the state, but enforcement because South Dakota does not have a liquor control division or a actual enforcement division. The enforcement of those laws are based on the city and the county. So RCPD would be able to do their normal checks like they would any other establishment and be able to enforce any laws. Uh, same with the sheriff's office, that type of thing. So there is enforcement levels at the city levels and the county levels. The license is issued by the state, but the enforcement is at the city and county level. Um, so when we are open, yes, they're, they're available for tasting for any product when they come in the door. Okay. But again, it's limited to two ounces a day. We actually do like a quarter ounce is for the tasting. And the tasting is mainly just exactly what you said, ma'am, so that people can try the product because it is a different product than what you'd normally see in a, in a, in a, in a liquor store. And it gives the people a chance to try it and see if they like it or not before they spend the money to buy a bottle of it to take home. And then you provide the, uh, like a small bottle or whatever size is? We sell in a 750 milliliter bottle, so it's a basic wine bottle size. And that's the only size we currently carry. Okay. And, and as far as somebody walking in just to say, I wanna try that, you can't judge who, who those people are necessarily to say, well, you aren't gonna buy anything, so we don't wanna sell it to you. Or no, you, it's hard to judge that. We've, we've, we've done that actually out in Box Elder where we've thought, we've had people walk in and we've thought, yeah, this guy's not going to, this person's not going to buy anything. They're just here to try a sample. They end up buying a bottle or two to take and walk out the door. And then other people, you walk in, you think, okay, this is going to be a sale. And it's like, no, they don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell who that person, I mean, you can't judge a book by a cover. Yeah, that's true. Okay, then let me ask you a question as far as how the, patio works. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm looking at the, the schematics and trying to figure this out. You have <laughs> so, so are we. Well, this is, that was just a proposal that we're, we're considering because Hay Camp is considering a beer, uh, beer garden area. They currently use that outdoor area with the overhead doors. They've had uh, bands play in those uh, on weekends and stuff like that. Um, so that was just part of what we that we're considering and proposing. We wanted to include it in the proposal, that way in case we do decide we want to do it, then we can just go ahead with it. But we aren't certain we're actually going to do that at this point. But okay. I can answer whatever, whatever I can answer, because like I said, there's no set plan in stone. Okay, because looking at the, the picture that, that uh, was shown, I'm trying to figure out, that's your front door. You have to go through your patio to get to your front door, and I thought, is that how that's going to work? I'm, I was Basically, just be sure. a, a wide patio walk, walkway type decking, like what uh, in front of the Hay Camp Brewery entryway, they've got their little raised area there that you walk up to to get into their store. That same principle of design, just a little bit larger, and with 
basically just room to set a, an outdoor table or two at. Okay. And as far as having, you know, like entertainment or anything like that that you might bring out to their... Any entertainment we did would basically be, we'd write on the coattails of Hay Camp Brewery, of okay. whatever they're already doing. We, we wouldn't be bringing in the location, the, the facility, the area that we're using isn't large enough to bring in anything else. Hay Camp already does enough with their event center and with the things they do over there that entertainment wise, it's, it's going to be writing on their coattails for that okay. type of stuff. Okay. Well, I, I wondered because I know Hay Camp's got that big center that they use or mm -hmm. are going to use. and. The other question then, um, can you get to your area through the Hay Camp? Can you go through that way? There is a walkway currently that goes from the location that we're, we're proposing into the event center, and then the event center goes obviously goes into the brewery. Okay. Um, the licenses, because of the differences in the licenses, our license covers our, our general, our area. So, People can't come over to our area, get a mixed drink, get a, get a bottle of liquor, take it over into Hay Camp and drink it. That's not allowed. Any more than they can grab a growler or whatever from Hay Camp and come over in our location and drink it because we're not licensed for beer. Gotcha. We're strictly licensed for the products that we make. Okay, I just wondered how that, the two are going to work together. There's, there's, door, there's not, it's, it's, there's a walkway through there, but there's one, two, three, three doorways between, there's two doorways between us and the event center and then the other doorway between the brewery itself okay. on the other side of the event center. Okay. So, there, so there is access, but it's not open access. Gotcha. And I know there's a access on the back side, I think, of Hay Camp where it's not like up for the customers. It's towards the back. There was a doorway that went back into your area, I thought. But. That's actually in our building proposal with the, with the building permits we'll be putting in. They're actually walling that section off because they're making a green room in that corner of the, of the area. And I, I, I'm not even going to pretend to know how to work this. But in the one corner in the back there, where you can see where it's blocked, like there's a little section off of there. They're creating a green room for their event center in that area for their artists and their performers. So that will actually be blocked off. Okay. There will be, and again, building permits and everything going on with all that type of stuff. There is a doorway to our alley, that, to the alley walkway, walk door, that we will share with. Okay, let me get to another picture. To get to another picture, we do. Uh, go on. Yeah, that one will work. Go back. All right. Yeah, this will actually be an angled wall because this is going to be their green room. There is a doorway to the outside right here, walk door, but that'll be a walkway through here that'll enter into their green room so that the performers can bring their equipment in from the alleyway and into the green room area here. But this will be a, a doorway here with a walkway and a, uh, a, another door that we'll have. So our, our main doorway into the building will be here as noted. This is our back entrance. There is an overhead door here that you can see in the pictures that that's where we deliver. Like when we take deliveries of a product, it's generally a pallet of empty bottles. So it's FedEx or UPS delivers it. It's a pallet of empty bottles or it's a drum of GNS, of neutral spirits. Okay. Uh, then as far as your front door, because there's that parking on the side, and I know people do park on the side there. I suppose it's people who work there or something. Yes, all the parking in that spot right now is all the other employees and other people that work in that office. Yeah. This area here is being occupied by, or is going to be occupied by another business. Uh, actually, an, a, an architectural firm, I believe it is. Okay. So they will have another doorway put in here. So the part of this parking may end up going away, but I don't believe they actually use like these spots right here. So okay. this parking here will still remain. Okay, that helps because I thought you're, you can't have a patio right by the parking lot that's going to have to remove and, some and, and that's why we're only looking at about 10 to 12 feet basically the same type of entryway decking that's in front of Hay Camp currently on the sidewalk out there that they're proposing eventually I believe they're, they've got an eventual proposal to put that decking around the okay. uh, corner of the building and everything too okay one, one last question you mentioned something about um, having somebody you know, check IDs so if somebody does come in to, to have a tasting of it I mean Obviously, I'm old enough, but you know, <laughs> there might be some people. Would you ask 
most people for an ID, or how does yes, that work? Yes, we do. Okay. And again, we've been operating this tasting room and, and on sale and off sale retail stuff out in Box Elder since May. Um, uh, my partner, my business partner, and I have both. Like I said, I was former law enforcement for many years. My uh, business partner and I both have worked security and uh, other positions within different liquor establishments in town uh, over the years uh, as part-time jobs to go with the, to supplement our full-time work. Um, so we're, we've gone through the TAPS program. I'm not sure if that's required with this or not. If the city does require the TAPS program for ourselves and our employees, then obviously we will more than happily attend those courses again and, and renew our permits and stuff that way. Okay, thank you. You've answered all the questions I, I have of you. I have one question of staff, okay. so thank you very much. Um, on the uh, stipulations, that last stipulation, that last sentence, is that supposed to say any changes in the conditional use would require a major amendment, or am I reading that wrong? Stipulation number three, I think it is. So there's two parts to that. So uh, it's written that any change in use which expands this business would require a major amendment to the conditional use. Um, any other conditional use in Central Business District that might be proposed for this suite would also require a major amendment to okay. this CUP. So I'm missing the word other. Pardon? I'm, so I'm missing the word other on the last sentence then. All other conditional uses. Or all conditional uses. Okay. Same meaning. Okay. Just it, to me, it was like all conditional uses need a major amendment. Well, yeah, I guess I, I understand. Yeah. It just didn't sound right to me. So that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Justin. You're up. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll just a couple comments, maybe not a questions, but. Um, and generally I'm in favor of something like this for downtown. I think it's a good thing. I think to me this is more of a <clears throat> less of a, a bar and more of a, a something that trends with the microbrewery trend going on, which is a social gathering that I think a lot of people like to do after work and, and things and isn't as conducive to maybe some of the issues you see with alcohol establishments. Um, I do appreciate the concern uh, with the Hope Center and the church. I think the proximity is um, obviously pretty close, closer than, than, than would be desirable for, for what you guys are doing. And with that, I think, Randy, you and your team um, have a great responsibility with what you're doing. Um, I do think that hearing you and your history and your, your past in law enforcement, you understand that probably more than most of us up here. So um, I'd just like to make the comment, I guess, that I, I hope that you continue the, the thought process and the responsibility that um, you do have with the proximity. However, I don't think that it's our job or our responsibility as a city or the or the business owner to um, be responsible for individuals actions either and so I don't think I think as long as you understand where you're at and the and potential demographic that may be around um, I still don't think I, I think it's a great idea and I think it's in a great location um, I think the Hope Center is in a great location it's just unfortunate that maybe they're right next door to each other um, but I also think individuals you know, that maybe go to the Hope Center for, for alcoholism or whatever, you know, can also go up the street to St. Joe to about 12 different bars. So I don't think not allowing this um, really solves any of those potential issues or concerns because of that. Um, and again, I just ask that Randy, you and your team just really understand your responsibility because of your proximity and potential people that may be wandering by and walking in and wanting to do that. And I know you can't judge a book by its cover and just refuse service, but I do think there's a lot of, um, again, I keep using the word responsibility with it. But I, I, I am generally in, in favor of this. I think it's a great idea. I think it's great for downtown. Um, but I, I, I think we all can appreciate, you know, the church and the, and the Hope Center's concerns, and as long as we can all kind of understand that. I would like to point out just a couple other quick things real fast. Right now, currently, there is a coffee shop in the corner of that building in, where the glass corner is, then the brewery and the events, or, event center. And like I say, there's an architectural firm looking at the other section there to the west of us. Um, they've also got a plumber that works out of that building. Uh, they've got a kitchen area that they're actually just in, just in negotiations with somebody to actually run a kitchen there. And 
this kind of goes with where I was going with this. The, even the kitchen part that they're putting in there is going to be more of a fine dining, be able to come in and get a steak and, and stuff like that, not cheese balls and french fries. It's, it's going to be more of a fine dining type of thing. So they'll be able to bring food into the brewery or into the distillery and sit down and have a drink or a beer, whichever the case may be, whichever they prefer, with their meat with a meal. And again, it's not burgers and brats, it's fine dining type is, is the current person they're negotiating with for the kitchen area. The other thing with our on-sale license is we sell drinks of our product. They're not cheap. We don't do dollar shots. We don't do two dollar shots when we do sell the alcohol on sale. Again, we limit the, off or the uh, tasting to a very small amount, just enough to taste the product so you can decide if you like it or not. If you want a drink, then you can get a drink. Our drinks, I don't think we're on the vortex level. <laughs> on top of the Alex Johnson up there, I don't think we're at that level of pricing, but it's not a $2 drink. It's not a $3 drink. It's not a $4 drink. It's not $1 shots. It's not a party atmosphere. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to mention that, but I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I assumed that prices would be higher than going to the liquor store and buying a bottle of you know, Our, McCormick's. As far as, so I as, think that also, it also kind of helps with the case of can somebody walk in and buy a bottle of booze who, who maybe shouldn't be. Off-sale um, prices, we keep, our, we, we keep our off-sale prices out of respect to the, to the retailers that are already currently selling our product, and especially in the community, because there are mo almost every liquor store in Rapid City currently carries our product. We keep our price range at the same price range they have. So it's not like you can come to our place and buy the bottle for $10 less than what you're going to get over at Boyd's. We keep it at that same level because we don't want to undersell the retailers that we currently have selling it. But we also don't overprice it, charge more because obviously we don't have the cost of a distributor and everything else involved with our sales. So it works out for us to keep it right at pretty much the same price that the, that the other liquor stores are selling it at. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate all the information yeah. you were willing to share with us. John, did you have something? Okay. Um, I don't have any other lights up uh, on this. Are there any further questions or comments that need answered here? Move approval. Kurt made the motion to approve item 10 per staff recommendations. I'll second. Uh, Galen seconded the motion. Any discussion on that motion? Just one. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Heard a no from John. I think that's the only one. So the motion carries with John as a no. Item number 11. Item number 11 is a rezoning request from Park Forest District to Low Density Residential District. Uh, just to give you an idea, we've seen this before. Uh, in 2017, City Council denied a similar request. Uh, city Council denial reflected what Planning Commission's concerns were, which were drainage and soil stability. After speaking with the applicant, they indicated that they are going to submit a soils report. They have not submitted it at this time, and thus we're recommending that the rezoning request be continued to the February 8th meeting, at which time we'll, we'll, we can talk about the, the application, but. Karen moved to continue this item to February 8th. John seconded that motion. Any discussion? All those in favor of continuing to February 8th, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Any discussion items, staff items? No. All right. Look for a motion to adjourn. Senate. Rachel made the motion. Galen second the motion. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. aye.